Yo, I'm Brendan. Imagine having the freedom to do what you want, when you want, without the burden of any kind of financial constraint. Picture yourself waking up every morning, not to the shrill sound of an alarm clock, but to the physical rhythm of your own life and whatever peaceful kind of thing you've built into your routine. This is the beauty of retiring early amongst other things like burritos and race cars. Today I'm gonna to show you exactly how and why we're tracking that glorious day for ourselves and how you can do the same thing. I know this feels like such a nerdy, ridiculous thing to do, but I'm convinced that it helps you to actually retire earlier when you can see where you need to go and what you need to make happen because you can see the progress you're making. It's like exercising. If you can't see any progress, you're less likely to wanna to keep going. But if you can see some progress, even if it's just a little tiny bit and you still have a long way to go, then it's really encouraging and it tells you that you're doing the right things, you're making some in progress, you're going in the right direction. I know some of you hearing this and you're thinking, why do I care? Why do I need to do this? I'm so far away. Like, trust me, I'm so far, it's not even worth talking about. Here's what I think is going to happen for you. I think that by doing this, it's going to transform your perspective because instead of retirement or financial freedom being a finish line that's so far away, it's beyond the horizon. It's just somewhere out there. There's lots of dollar signs involved. You have no idea where that is. What we're doing today transforms that because it goes from this ethereal, who knows what or when or if this could ever happen type of a thing. And it gives it defined, trackable, controllable elements. These are things within your control. These are things that you can do to make that a reality. And now you can see the finish line. You'll see the date in which you can retire. You'll see the actual amount of money that you need to retire. And when you have those two things, you can develop a plan to get there. So today I'm going to break that down and show you how to think about early retirement, what exactly you need to know to get there, how to do the numbers yourself to figure out how close or how far away you are and how to track it all along the way. And and then how to retire as early as possible. To do that, we're gonna be diving in with some totally free tools. It's all just built in Google Sheets. It's very, very simple. So follow along and see where you need to be to retire early. Let's go. But wait, those of you who don't like spreadsheets, don't leave just yet because I also have two other tools that I'll show you at the very end that are both free, that are easier and more beautiful to use than my spreadsheet. So the principles still apply whenever we look at the spreadsheet, but the other two tools I'll show you are beautiful and much easier to use if you don't love spreadsheets. So there's something here for everybody. All right, back to the video. The starting place for any kind of early retirement calculation is just how much money do we need? What are our actual expenses? If you live like Jeff Bezos and you get custom yachts built, you need a lot more money than if you live really modestly and are like a minimalist and you can survive on 1500 bucks a month. And if you're like me and you hate budgeting and you don't know exactly the dollar amount that you spend every month, then just fast forward to how much do you get paid every month? Because unless you're getting in tons and tons of debt and that debt is accruing over time, then what you get paid is a close enough number to at least get started with. If you already know what you spend every month, then let's put that in here. So today, just as an example, I just picked a number. Let's say $5,500 a month is what somebody's gonna wanna spend in retirement. And here's where people make their first mistake. They think, oh, well, I'm just gonna spend $5,500 in retirement for the rest of all time. So we might start doing some research and looking stuff up online or reading books and trying to figure out how to make 5,500 bucks a month in retirement, when really that's the wrong number. The tricky thing here is that inflation is going to make the amount of money that we need just to survive go up and up and up every year. So what I like to do is project that out. I want to see that happening over time so I can visualize and go, okay, I don't need to plan on the amount of money I need today to survive. In the future, whenever I'm ready to retire, that's the amount of money I need up there. That's the actual dollar figure I'm shooting for. Thankfully, it's really simple to do this in Google Sheets. All we do is we take the current amount that you might be spending per month and then increase that by 3% per year. So in our example, if somebody spends 5,500 bucks a month now in April of 2024, then by the time we get down here into April of 2025, just to maintain your standard of living, not to make any more money or to live any more lavishly, just to keep everything the same, you need to plan on having $5,667 per month in income. And so what we see as we scroll down here is a target that's getting further and further away from us. Our goal is running away at the rate of inflation. And this is a crucial part of figuring out your early retirement. Like if we fast forward 10 years from now and we look at April of 2034, just for our example person here to live the same way they do right now, they would need way more than 5,500 bucks a month. They would need almost $2,000 a month more than that, 7,421, just to maintain their standard of living. A big line of numbers is fine, but I think it's easier to visualize this in a chart. So let's look at this chart together. This blue line represents the amount of money that this example person needs just to survive based on their current standard of living today. Look how crazy that gets. In April of 2067, they would need to be making $20,000 a month to maintain the standard of living of somebody making 
$5,500 a month in April of 2024. I realize it's a long time in the future, but you know, this is the difference between us hearing about our grandparents living on $3,000 a year versus us needing $40,000 a year. It's not that everything was cheaper back then. This is what inflation does. It just makes all the numbers that much bigger. So if we look at this together and we think about what the implications really are, it's a little bit terrifying because I look at this and I go, our goal is running away from us. It's, it's accelerating away and we've got to try and figure out a way to catch up because I don't even have enough money to retire today, let alone in the future when these numbers are so much bigger. Somehow we've got to accrue money to grow our money at a faster rate then this thing is running away from us. We've got to be able to run after it, catch up to it and grab it. And at that point we can retire. You can see the more time goes on in the future on this chart, the more money you need to retire. The numbers just keep going up and up and up. Okay, scary problem has been presented out here in front of us. Insurmountable tasks to try and catch up to this ever growing need. Now, how do we take this and figure out how much money we need to invest to get there, to get to this finish line of financial freedom, of early retirement, of being able to wake up without an alarm clock and instead just wake up to the smell of a burrito or the sound of a race car starting up. That's what I want. Well, thankfully, this is not difficult math to do. This is a very easy thing for us to figure out. Based on loads of research and people much smarter than us, it's very easy for us to figure out this math because all we have to do is say, all right, if I'm spending $5,500 a month, as an example here. We take that amount, we multiply it by 12, so we know how much that is for every year. So what that's saying is you need $66,000 per year to survive. And then we multiply that again by 25. And just like that, here's our answer. So whenever we multiply that yearly amount that we need by 25, this is called the 4% rule. And when it comes to talking about investing and retiring early, the 4% rule is a very standard kind of rule of thumb because it's been tried and tested so much. And what it's saying is if you have a big chunk of money invested, like this $1.65 million. You can take out 4% every year. So you can take out your salary of $66,000. The rest of the money stays invested and then it continues to grow over time. And then the next year you take out 4% again plus whatever the inflation rate has been. And so this allows you to keep up with inflation over time so your lifestyle remains the same, but your money stays intact. You know, your nest egg is still there generating money for you so you never run out of money and you never have to worry about that. If that math is still confusing to you, think about it like this. If you divide any number by 0.04, then that gives you 25 times whatever that original number was. So if we take 100, we divide it by 0.04, which is 4%, that gives us 2,500. Or if we take 100 and we multiply it by 25, we get the same result. So the 4% rule and the multiplying by 25 are the same finish line, if you will. Either way, we're saying the same thing. To get 5,500 bucks a month, we would need $1.65 million invested. So we had the same chart before saying our expenses are going up and up and up over time. We're going to need more and more and more money over time just to live our same standard of living. And you can see now this new column is equally as depressing because the amount of money that we need to have invested to cover those ever increasing costs is also going way up over time. We go from needing 1.65 million this year to needing 1.7 million next year. 1.75 the year after that. 10 years from now in April of 2034, because inflation has made our standard of living just so expensive in and of itself, the amount of money that you would need invested is 2.2 million. And just to have that same lifestyle by July of 2067, they would need $6 million invested. So this is where that logic of saying, oh, I just need a million bucks to build a retire doesn't make any sense. The amount of money we need to retire is ever changing. It's always going up over time, assuming your lifestyle is the same. If somehow you decrease your lifestyle at the same rate of inflation, then this could be a straight line. This could be the, the same $2 million or whatever it is across all time. But if you're doing that, then by the time you're 80 years old, you're like living outside in a tent and eating pop tarts all day and there's no standard of living. So for most of us, we want to maintain a consistent standard of living over time, which means this amount that we need to have invested is going up and up and up over time. So now we've laid out these odds against us, these two ever growing amounts of money that we need. Our goal is racing away from us. Now let's see what it looks like to track our own inputs and our own investing and how fast we can reel that in and make early retirement a reality. It all comes back to today. It all comes back to the amount of money that we're spending every month that will determine our future and what we need and what we're able to do in terms of retiring early. So if we go back to this hypothetical person in April of 2024 spending $5,500 per month, they would need as of like today to retire $1.65 million. But now we need to know how much that hypothetical person already has invested. Let's pick a number out of the air and say they have $650,000 invested now. Obviously, that's a lot less money than the $1.65 million they need to retire today 
say, but what happens over time if they keep investing? If that money they have invested keeps growing? All we have to do is compare the rate of growth of that money they have invested versus the invested amount that they need. And so now everything becomes clear if I reveal the data and I'll show you the chart also here in a second. And that's really where things become super clear. So as an example, this fictitious person, let's call her Bonnie. Bonnie has 650 grand now. She's expecting to make eight and a half percent interest per year and she's investing 1200 bucks every month. So now what's happening is her investments are growing every month because of the amount she's putting in and they're growing every month because they're invested. And so her invested amount is increasing over time. By January of next year, she's expecting to have over 700,000. In two years, she thinks she'll have 800,000. By July of 2028, so what is that, four years and a few months, she'll be an invested millionaire. Just her investments alone, no house value, no cars, no cash, nothing else, just her investments will be worth a million bucks. But that's still a problem because at that point, she'll need 1.87 million. But what's actually happening here is the amount that Bonnie has invested is growing faster than the amount that she needs to have invested. And so her investment accounts are catching up to her needs. It's like there's a car driving away from her at 30 miles an hour. That's the effect of inflation on her general monthly needs. But the car that she's in, her investments, is going 50 miles an hour. And so even though that car has been driving away from her, her car that she's in now is, is catching up. There's a closing speed happening there. And it's just a matter of time until she catches and surpasses that front car that represents her needs. So let's keep scrolling down and watch that catch up happen. At this point, it's been 10 years. This is where we looked before and we went, oh my gosh, her monthly expenses went from 5,500 a month to 7,400 a month. That's such a big jump. She doesn't need 1.65 million. She needs 2.2 million at that point. But her investments have also been growing like mad. She'd have 1.74 million at that point. So she's closing that gap because right now the difference between these two is what? 500 grand? When she started, the difference between the amount that she had and the amount that she needed was a million. So in 10 years, she's closed that gap by half. And when we keep scrolling down, we finally find the point where these two amounts equal each other, where the amount that she has invested is actually more than the invested amount that she needs. In April of 2038, so 14 years from now, she's projected to have $2.51 million, and she's projected to need slightly less than that. So at this point, she's financially free. She has all the money in the world that she needs to cover 100% of her living expenses. Okay, a screen full of numbers nobody likes, except for me and a few nerds out there. So let's look at a chart and make this a little clearer. Now, this is it. This is the thing we've been waiting for. This tells us the entire story of what we've done so far, and it's so exciting. So this is taking us on that same journey where Bonnie sits today. She's way back here, and she has this massive gap between what she needs, which is the red line, and what she has, which is the green line. It feels probably insurmountable. And if she wasn't paying attention and doing this kind of tracking, she might notice oh wow, what I need is going up over time. My needs are racing away from me and I don't know if I'll ever get there. And that's accurate. Your needs are racing away from you in terms of your lifestyle costs every year going up with inflation. But because she's a G and she's already been investing and she's investing heavily now, her money's growing. She's shoveling in 1200 bucks a month every month. You notice that this gap between the red line and the green line is shrinking. So after four years, when she's officially an invested millionaire, this gap is getting kind of small. And 10 years from today, this gap is getting positively tiny. The difference between what she needs in the red here and what she has in the green here is getting really, really small. Until finally we reach this crossover point, this magic time when the green money that she has surpasses her needs in terms of the red line. And that's what happens right here whenever these two lines cross over. That is the point at which she's 100% financially independent. And for the sake of clarity, so that you can actually see that exact point when the crossover happens, I've sort of condensed the chart down and zoomed in so we can see what her life looks like between now and that point of financial independence. Because this is the long, slow, hard, dark road of I'm just investing. I'm not able to benefit from it in any particular way. I'm working my job like I always am. I'm choosing to live on less money than I always do. And for what? That's what this gap feels like in here. That's the point whenever we're eating healthy and we're exercising and we're lifting weights and we're doing all the things we should be doing, but we have yet to realize the fruits of our labor. Yeah, the progress is slow. That's annoying. If she wanted to speed it up, she would have to invest more money or she'd have to lower her lifestyle. But either way, you're in control of those factors. If you have got to reel this date in, you can lower down your lifestyle and make it cheaper, which is going to lower this red line and bring it down closer and closer to where you need to be on that green line. If you want to accelerate the growth of your own money, 
you can invest more money, pick up a shift, get an extra job, work hard for that promotion, whatever it takes, and bump this green line's growth up so it's happening faster and faster. And then what people do is they'll do both of those at the same time. If you really want to retire early, that's the game. Lower your expenses and your need to have a giant nest egg, raise up your earning power, and squeeze those two lines together until they're as close as possible as early as possible. And as you invest as hard as you can, you're going to make that crossover point happen really, really soon. You might notice that none of this timeline has to do with age because your ability to retire isn't tied directly to your age. It's tied to your lifestyle, to the amount of money you spend, and the amount of money you have invested. Maybe Bonnie's 20 years old and she's crushing it because she inherited 650 grand and she's got that invested and now she's investing the rest herself. Or maybe Bonnie is 50 years old. She's worked to this point and she's planning out this last 12, 14 years before she reaches retirement and she wants to make sure that she can make that goal happen. Our ability to be financially free isn't tied to our age, it's tied to our relationship between these two lines, between the red line of what we need and the green line of what we have. I like to think of it this way, that little red line showing the amount that we have in terms of our expenses is there for all of us and it's there no matter what. Everybody has a dollar figure that we need to live on, whether that's 1500 bucks a month or 15,000 bucks a month, that dollar figure is there. The most powerful part of this is that green line that's shooting up there at the end because the earlier we start investing, the more we shift that whole curve back to the left, which means the more power we have, the more options we have, the quicker we reach financial independence. And the way that we do that is invest as early as possible, as much as possible. If you started investing $10,000 per year the day you turned 18, you'd be financially free a lot quicker than the person who started investing $10,000 a year when they were 44. You don't even get to be on the graph until you start investing. And if you do it earlier, you reap the benefits earlier. So now let's do a couple of examples to show the power of having this already set up. The beautiful thing is at any time, if you need to change the variables in here, it's not a big deal. I can reduce the amount that somebody needs to spend, or I can reduce the amount someone has invested or increase the amount that they're going to invest or whatever, manipulate all of this and everything else changes for us to tell us that same story. How far away are we today? When is that time coming that we can be able to retire? How fast are we going to be able to reel in these monthly expenses that keep growing? Let's do a really exciting example and say that Bonnie, our same person from before, has realized that she is living way too lavishly. She doesn't need to spend 5500 bucks a month. Maybe she moves somewhere else and can live a lot cheaper. She can still do her same job and still invest in the same way. Bonnie makes a radical change and reduces her living expenses from 5500 a month to 3500 a month. Now all these things self adjust for her in the first couple columns to say all of her monthly expenses are now adjusted down and the invested amount that she needs is adjusted down. She barely needs a million bucks now. Instead of 1.6 million, lowering her lifestyle has made it so that the invested amount she needs is only basically a million. So she still has her same amount invested. It's still growing at the same rate. She's still investing the same 1200 bucks a year. Watch how much sooner that crossover point happens. Boom. Here we are in 82 months of investing, she'd be able to retire. She'd be financially free, able to do whatever she wants because the amount that she has invested has surpassed the amount that she needs to have invested. So just by her lowering her standard of living, not investing any more money, she's financially free in just under seven years. But that's a very optimistic kind of viewpoint. You know, she lowers her expenses a ton. She still has a bunch of money to invest. She still has a bunch of money already invested. What if we put in a little bit more of the average person's numbers here? Let's pick millennials, for example, here. The median 401k balance for people who are in their 30s right now is somewhere around $70,000. So let's say this is Trevor now. And Trevor needs thirty. 3500 bucks a month to live. He's the average millennial with $70,000 in his 401k. He's still investing well. He's expecting to get 8.5% interest and he's able to invest 100 bucks a week, which is 400 bucks a month. So his starting point here, his gap between the amount he has invested and the amount he needs is way bigger than Bonnie's was. I mean, 70 grand is a lot of money to have, but compared to the million that he needs, he's just barely gotten started. Come on now, Trevor, stick with it, buddy. Don't give up. And we can see comparing the amount of money that he's going to need over time, growing and growing this red line versus the amount of money that he has right now, the green line, he's got a little while to wait before those lines intersect. Because he's starting out with such a massive gap, it takes him a while to build up a real substantial amount of money invested. And because he's taken a long time to do that, his expenses also have a long time to grow. He might be a little bit frustrated because in December of 2049, he's got a million dollars in his investing account. But by our math, he's still way off. He still needs $2.5 million more than that to be able to be totally financially free and maintain his current lifestyle. So if we keep scrolling down and finally find the point where the amount that he would have in invested exceeds the amount that he would need to be able to retire, it's a long time in the future. We're talking March of 2063. He'd be financially free. Trevor, buddy, everything held consistent. 
you've got 39 years of investing ahead of you. That means even if you're on the younger side as a millennial, let's say you're 30, you're not 100% financially free by your own means based on these projections until you're 69. For me, even though it's a long time to wait and invest, this is really informative because maybe Trevor up to this point was like, hey man, I'm investing, I'm getting it done, I'm gonna retire pretty soon. The average millennial thinks they're gonna retire by or before 60. And this could be a real reality check for somebody like him to go, wait a minute, there's not a way for this to really happen unless I somehow get miraculous investing returns or I start investing a lot more money or I somehow cut my expenses and live like an absolute minimalist, I'm not going to make these two lines merge. And so this can be a call to action for somebody like Trevor to go, all right, if I want to reel that in and I don't want to wait until I'm 69 to retire, I've got to figure out a way to make that happen. And that's why I love this world so much because yeah, these are charts and numbers and it's very nerdy. But what this translates to for his life is a trajectory for his plans. Maybe he loves his current job, loves his current lifestyle, loves the way everything is set up right now and doesn't want to change it. Well, even somebody like him still has options because you don't have to necessarily wait until you've got 100% of your expenses covered. There's other forms of financial independence that you can jump into and we can figure that out right now. There's a really sweet option that I think more people should consider called Baristify. And I don't really love that name, but the implication is that you could be financially independent with the addition of the kind of income that you would make being a barista. So we're saying that instead of having to replace all of Trevor's income, maybe he just needs to replace most of it. And then in retirement, he'll have a little part-time job at a golf course or find somewhere else that is kind of a hobby for him that he loves, that he also gets paid for. And that way he keeps busy in retirement. Maybe he maintains some kind of insurance coverage or healthcare benefits that are really cool to have whenever you have a real job. He gets to be around people. And typically all those things have positive benefits on your health anyway. Plus this way, he doesn't have to have so much money invested. So let's assume that that barista income or that golf course income or whatever that looks like would be like 1500 bucks a month. And instead he's going to be partially reliant on his own money, partially reliant on the job income. So when that's the case, he goes from needing 3,500 bucks a month in retirement solely from his investments down to just $2,000 a month from his investments because the other 1500 is coming from his job, his little part-time gig. All we have to do is change this very first number to 2000 because now that's the goal or in the future, the equivalent of what $2,000 a month will provide him with the same kind of lifestyle. So now He's looking at really reeling in that timeline. Instead of waiting until he's 69, now he can retire at 59. He's got another decade of healthy, fun years ahead of him just because he's picking up this part-time work. So he would need $1.43 million to retire, and his investments would be worth around that time, potentially, $1.44 million. So he's there. Instead of waiting 39 years, he's only waiting 29 years. He gets to be around other people. There's a lot of pros to having this kind of approach to your retirement. And of course, the charts all self-adjust to show you this too. Of course, I to build this for myself because I'm a nerd like that, but there's also pre-made products that can do this kind of work for you. And some of them are even free. There's this one I found online that is really clean and really simple. And I love the way that he's built this. This is called the Mad Fientist, like financial independence, Mad Scientist, Mad Fientist, FI Laboratory. And so what you can do in here is set up an account. It's totally for free. And then you just input the same numbers that I basically was inputting into my manual spreadsheet, but you just have to update it then every month and say, our expenses this month were this much. The amount of our total investments was that much. And then it does the rest of the math for you. So in this example page here, this white line is this person's expenses, which seem to oscillate a lot over time. But as they've tracked over the period of time, that's how much money they've spent each month. Then the pink line shows them their average expenses. And so over the course of time, that's the amount of money that his kind of calculator is going to track for you and say, this is how much money you need to plan on being able to have by way of your investments. Then because you're putting in the total amount of money that you have invested in this little tracker too, that's what's showing up on this green line. So for this person, their investments are going up and up and up over time, but he's not showing you the total amount you have invested. He's showing you the amount of money that you can withdraw per month from your investments. So the amount of money you need is the pink line. The amount of money you have in terms of withdrawable assets every month is the green line. Then he does that math for you and he subtracts the time away from today. So he says this person's hypothetical FI date, their financial independence date would be May of 2032. That's eight years and one month away. And their current monthly passive income is $2,203. So he's projecting if you keep doing this, that little green line, just like mine, is gonna come up and intersect the pink line. No spreadsheet building no necessary nerdery like I had to do here. Then there's another version of a tool like this that's even more nerdy, and I almost can't believe this is free, but the way they've structured this makes sense because it basically lets you play in the thing once and you can input all of your information, all of your assets, like your investments, your car, your house, all that kind of stuff. You put in your liabilities in terms of your debt. Then you can fill out your plans for the future and say, here's how much you think your income is gonna be. Here's how much you think your expenses are gonna be. And then it literally maps out your entire retirement for you, including like big life events. So you can 
say you're going to sell your car at a certain time, you're going to pay off your student loans, maybe you have an emergency. Then it says you reach financial independence, you can plan for a healthcare expense every year. You can have a separate budget category for vacations that it all plots out for you. This is an incredible, incredible tool, and it's ridiculous that you can do it even once for free. And you can develop multiple plans here too. So you could have like plan one, Bonnie keeps working and Trevor retires early. Or plan two, everyone keeps working or whatever and have all these different kind of variations of it all displayed for you in this like very beautiful way. The only catch with it, if you will, is that if you want to come back to it later, you'll lose all that data that you inputted. And so you'd have to like pay for a, a monthly subscription at that point. But if you're a massive nerd and you don't want to have to go through the trouble of having to build your own spreadsheet and potentially make a bunch of mistakes and, and build in these kinds of like like little events here and there where maybe you sell a vehicle or you increase your projected health expenses or you plan for a vacation or whatever, like to build all that into a spreadsheet would be a giant pain. When this all does that for you, it's really, really cool. Gosh, if I'm honest, the more I look at this, the more I want it. So if you pay annually, the premium membership, which is probably the one that I would want is nine bucks a month or for a lifetime, you could pay 520 bucks and just have it for forever. You just can't create and manage clients or have an advisor dashboard. I mean, this is like a pro level tool. If you're a financial advisor, you could use this thing. It's wild. I've only barely played with this thing a little bit and so I haven't had a real chance to dig into it and, and test it for a long period of time but I think this is a phenomenal tool now I want to be a little vulnerable with you and share with you our successes our mistakes and our perspective shifts along the way on, on our own personal finance journey part of the reason why I'm here making videos for you is I don't think people talk about money enough and so even if I'm just talking to you about our journey and what we've learned that's more money conversations than a lot of us have in a current week but I hope it also inspires you to talk more about your own life and money with people in your life that you trust I think we learn from each other we grow or challenge when it comes to money because it's really core to what we think is important in life and our values and all that stuff. So enough chitter chatter. What are the mistakes that we've made along the way in our pursuit of financial independence? For myself, I'm a little bit ashamed to say that I just flat did not take my career seriously until I wanted to get married. It was like Peter Pan kind of syndrome. I just want to spend all my 20s finding stuff that's fun to do, finding a job that's interesting, that kind of aligns with my interests, not really seeking out something that's best for a high income, stability, benefits, all that kind of thing. I just wasn't into it. And I thought that because I had stronger values elsewhere, like my family or my friends or my spiritual journey at the time, I thought that that somehow justified me to not really have to care about a career. Well, I care about these other things more than a career. And I think priorities are real. I think you have to pick things that matter to you more than other things. For me, that was just an excuse to not really try that hard, to not push myself, to not have to get in the way of my fun seeking behavior. And so because I was finally in my late 20s until I got serious about my career and growth and learning about business and all that kind of stuff, it severely limited the amount of money that I had to invest and the timeline that I had to invest it. Had I gotten seriously five or 10 years earlier, we could be financially free by now. So don't take for granted your early career life because even if you can't be making a ton more money right away, you can be learning, you can be taking it seriously and you can be acquiring those skills that will get you a lot more money, which means you can invest a lot more. The other mistake I wanted to share that I personally made was I did what a lot of us do. I just invested using a friend's help from college. I didn't even know the guy that well in college. He was just some dude that I kind of sort of knew. He worked in the money industry. Okay, well, I've got some money that I want to invest. Let me talk to this guy. So I called him up before I did any research, before I read anything, before I really knew anything about investing. And then whatever he told me, I just took his word for it. So he said, hey, we're going to invest in these things. You pay a fee up front that you never pay again. And it's really great. Let's do it. And I said, okay, sure. Pretty easy sale when I had nothing to compare it to. Well, it turns out I was paying way higher fees than I needed to whenever I did that. And thankfully, like a year or two after I started with him, I did do a bunch of research and read books and learned a bunch more and realized, oh, I'm getting hosed. I've got to get out of here. So I ripped all my money away from him and started managing it myself and I didn't have to pay those fees anymore. But had I left that money there for my entire career or my entire lifespan, I would have been shortchanged hundreds of thousands of dollars. It would have been totally ridiculous. I'm by no means telling you what to do, but for me, those fees were way too high for me to live with over the course of my lifetime. And so I got out of there. Now I'll share three successes that we had when it came to our personal finance journey. Then also a fourth success that some people are going to disagree with us on. They're going to say, no, you made a mistake there, but I'm going to still count it as a success technically. So the first one was we did still get started investing relatively early. I mean, I was probably in my mid twenties whenever I got a 401k started and had an IRA and got that ball rolling. It was really slow, but we did technically get started early, at least compared to the average person. So 
that helps us out a lot. The next success is a huge one, and that's that my partner and I got on the same page with money basically right off the bat. We did premarital counseling, we had to make a budget, we had to talk about money, we talked about what it was like growing up with our different families, and we had to kind of hash out what does money mean to us. This is possibly the single biggest success that we had when it came to our money, because if you're not on the same page with your partner, then everything kind of unravels. So as much fun as it is to make charts and to pursue the numbers and do whatever, if you've got a partner in your life or somebody that you're sharing finances with, it's a really good idea to spend whatever time you need to get on the same page and stay on the same page. And this is something that I'm actually still working on because I've realized we've been together for like 10 years and we haven't had like a high level discussion of where do we want to be? What do we want to work towards for the next five or 10 years and compare that to where we are today? What are we doing today versus where do we want to be? How do we connect those dots? Are our visions of the future the same? Spoiler alert, they won't be. Then how do we come together and understand the other person's perspective and hopefully get on the same page? So that's something that I'm working on now and I'll report back with any important lessons I learned there. The third success we had was that we invested pretty darn heavily early on. In terms of our percentage of our income, we were investing 10%, 15%, 20%, 30% eventually as our incomes grew and we had kept our expenses is largely the same. And that's just following the law of compound interest. I mean, you see there in those charts, the earlier you get the money in there, the faster that becomes a substantial amount that can totally change your life. Now, this fourth success that we had that some people are going to really disagree with me on is we followed Dave Ramsey's home buying advice. In hindsight, even I agree, we should have bought a giant house. We should have had a much bigger mortgage and that would have worked out amazingly for us because what's happened since we bought a house is homes have basically doubled or tripled in value. Home loans have gotten three, four, four times more expensive since then. And so had we just jumped on that and had all the debt possible with our mortgage, we would have experienced this crazy growth in terms of our net worth. I haven't actually done the math, but I think it would have grown at the same rate or even faster than our investments have grown. And in the meantime, we would have been in a big, nice house instead of a medium sized, okay, decently nice house. And so what we chose instead was to buy a much cheaper house, well within our means, get a 15 year mortgage, put 20% down and then plan on having a paid off mortgage pretty early on. Then home loans got even cheaper after we bought this house. We refinanced for a 10 year mortgage. And right now we're on track to pay off the house by the time I turn 43. So then someday I'll make a video called Mortgage Free at 43. And so both outcomes are good. Like they're objectively good outcomes. We're ridiculously fortunate to have either option. But I think some people would look at that and they would go, well, you made a mistake because you could have made money doing this other thing. And I still technically call it a success, even though I do have some regret around that, because in hindsight, we would have been better off had we done that at the time, knowing what we knew without having any kind of foresight to know our home value is going to skyrocket or not. Our mortgage rate is going to go way up or not. Or are we going to have some kind of crazy hardship where we don't have an income? We don't know what's going to happen. Without that crystal ball, we made a great decision because we played it safe. We bought a house nice enough to live in, but not so nice that it's going to stretch us financially. Let me know what your opinion is on that. Was that a good decision or not? Should we have bought a bigger house or not? Now I just want to share one perspective shift that I've had along the way that I was not expecting at all in this journey. You know, my wife and I are millennials. And so we came out of school at the time, basically during the great recession. None of our friends had a lot of money. None of our friends had great jobs. We were all living kind of modest, meager lifestyles. And then as time has gone on, everybody's gotten slightly better jobs, slightly more income. And because of that, we all have more options. And so what my wife and I did was early on, we said, we're going to buy a much cheaper house than we can afford. We're going to live with vehicles that are older and not as nice as we could afford. Instead, we're going to invest a bunch of money. And so I was not expecting it to be so hard for both of us to resist that urge to compare ourselves to peers, to friends, to family members, because whenever people spend money, it's obvious, it's public, it's out there in the world to see, whether you physically see it or you see it on social media or whatever. And so maybe you have an idea that those people make the same money that we do or even less money than we do, but they're spending all this money. They're going on these vacations and they're buying that new thing and they're doing this cool stuff. It's really hard to not be jealous of those activities especially when they're at your fingertips. You could choose to do that. Snap your fingers, go do the thing. But when we're doing this thing that isn't public called investing, we're doing this very private activity where, yeah, my my numbers in my bank account are going up, but there's nothing anybody's going to see. And I'm not going to awkwardly like walk up to them and go, hey, look at me, I've got a hundred grand invested, like pat me on the back. You have to be really okay with just having this kind of quiet confidence, this, this quiet satisfaction in yourself to know I'm doing the right thing. I've made this decision. I have this end goal in mind. And yeah, I have to tone things down now, but I think it's going to be worth in the future because I'm going to have so many more options. And if I had to guess, I think this is one of those 
those factors that keeps a lot of people from being able to invest because that street of comparison is just one way. You can only compare yourself to people's visible public things. And that's really how they spend their money. I don't see people on Instagram and Facebook and wherever else screenshotting their investment accounts or screenshotting their debt for that matter. You know, what if those same people that went on those cool trips and bought those cool vehicles had to reveal their net worth situation? Wow, cool Raptor, bro. Sucks that you're a hundred grand in the hole between your two vehicles. You know, that would kind of shift the perspective there a little bit. But most often we just assume, well, they just must be smarter than me. They just must be richer than me. They must be doing things righter than me. Maybe not. Maybe they're in the hole and it sucks. I thought by creating those options for ourselves in the future, we were clearly doing the right thing, but it was more of a challenge than I expected to have uh, those limitations in terms of our lifestyle. I've got to run because I'm late for my dentist appointment, but if you want to watch another video, click right here and I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.